Okay, so we uh, come again to 1 John chapter 5. Uh, I particularly need the Lord's help uh, seeing I prepared this before we went away. We got back at 4 o'clock yesterday, so it wasn't particularly a a good time to start preparing. Uh, So I have to try to remember uh, the things I felt very much uh, encouraged by in this passage. So let's pray first of all that God will help us, not only as we read the scripture, but as we consider it together. Father, we thank you that you breathed uh, your words into life, Father, by your Holy Spirit. And Father, we would ask now that again you would breathe life into the words as we consider them, that they might live for us. We thank you that your word is uh, living and active, and we pray that it will be this morning. So Lord, we ask for your help as we consider these words together, in that precious name of Jesus. Amen. We're only going to look at verses 18 to 21 of 1 John 5, but it would be good to read uh, from verse 13, just to again put them in context. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. (coughs) And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make request for this. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not leading to death. We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We know that the Son of God has come, and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. So this morning uh, we come back and uh, we just uh, conclude now the, uh, this particular uh, uh, letter. Uh, we might uh, recapitulate a bit. Uh, we saw that whole matter about sin to death, which wasn't easy to understand. Uh, but we saw very much a, uh, an example of that in the book of Revelation, where Jezebel, at the church of Thyatira, who was a false prophetess, uh, was leading them into immorality and into idolatry, uh, teaching them things and encouraging things that they should not uh, uh, be involved in. And God said very clearly, or Jesus said very clearly, he had given her time to repent. And now, basically, that he would cast her on a bed of sickness and she would die. There is a time when people have gone so far that there is no way back, so sold themselves out. And we looked at other examples as well in Scripture, not quite as extreme as that, but where really there was no way back because they had so hardened their hearts against God. And we saw really in the context here uh, that what was happening, that there were those who were dying, uh, denying a true incarnation. That uh, Jesus was some sort of phantom. Uh, This was what uh, some of the Gnostics who had taken on a measure of Christianity, but what they were saying that uh, because matter is evil, Jesus could not have had a a real body. And that uh, when... Uh, The man Jesus was baptized, the divine Christ came upon him. So they were actually denying uh, not only the uh, incarnation, but they were denying the true divinity of Christ. So they were removing real essential things uh, from the gospel. And uh, they were also undermining the sacrificial work of Christ. Because you remember, John talks about uh, Jesus came by water, but he says he came by blood as well. Some were just saying that he came at the, at, uh, the baptism, the divine Christ there, but left before Jesus, was, the man, was crucified. 
But we know it wasn't just a man who was crucified, it was the Son of God. Because no man could save us, because every man, every woman has sinned. It had to be a God-man, as it were. So they were undermining the sacrificial work of Christ, and therefore really rejecting the whole matter of salvation entirely. Uh, This was nothing more than apostasy. And probably what John was saying in the context here, remembering all that has gone before, some have now gone so far that even if they're sick, there's no way of recovering their, uh, of being healed. God will not answer. This is a sickness to death. And of course, we know that God sometimes does remove uh, the very life of some uh, because uh, they are so leading people astray and acting wickedly. Well, that was part of the background that we were considering last time. I think, therefore, John goes on to reassure them that there are some things that we know that are absolutely vital and bring us eternal life. And so there are three things that uh, particularly uh, we need to be remembering. And the first thing is really that uh, we know that God protects us from the evil one and even keeps us uh, from going on sinning. And we need to remember just some of those things that uh, John has already said. Uh, but uh, here I think there's very much the assurance of God's keeping power. For those who really want to follow the Lord, the Lord will keep them. I think that's uh, what is being said here. Uh, because we've seen all the apostasy that was around at the time when John wrote this letter. And he's just simply saying to them, If you're continuing to walk with God, you can be absolutely sure. And if you've been truly born of God, you can be sure that God will keep you. Mind as we've said before, there are warnings in Scripture. uh, That it's not a matter of once saved, always saved, as some would uh, try to bring out. Scripture warns that there can be, because of apostasy, uh, a true falling away and losing our salvation. But here he's talking about not only uh, uh, that assurance of the keeping power, and uh, I was going to refer to to Jude. You remember when we were going through uh, Jude in our midweek Bible study, uh, that we saw just how he ended. And again, the background there is those who are going astray, those who started off all right, even the angels who fell, and the uh, penalties that came upon Sodom and Gomorrah, warning for those who are leading people astray, turning grace into licentiousness, as it said. And by that we, we saw that basically they were saying, well, the grace of God is great. It doesn't matter what sort of life you live, God will forgive you. No, uh, and Paul himself challenged that very idea. Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? He said, no, we died to sin. Uh, And Jude uh, is taking up that same idea. And he says, therefore, for those of you who are keeping yourselves in the love of God, as he spoke about early on in uh, in verse uh, um, 21, he says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with, with great joy, to the only God and Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, Be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. He is able to keep you from stumbling. There may be those who are trying to influence you, but he is able to keep you from stumbling. So if we come back again to 1 John, he's saying there uh, in verse 18, We know that the one who is born of God, uh, uh, that no one born of God, sorry, sins. And again, remember we saw right at the beginning of this letter, or early on in the letter, uh, it's the present continuous uh, tense in the Greek. In other words, you do not go on sinning in the way that you once did. Sin is broken in your lives. We still sin from, uh, from time to time. Again, John has already reminded us, uh, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Right back in the beginning of chapter 2, so... And he says, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourselves, and the truth is not in you. But he says, I'm writing to these things to you that you may not sin. So basically he's saying, yes, we haven't come to that sinless point yet, but God has broken the power of sin, and thank God we have cleansing for sin when we do. But strive to, uh, to end sin in your life as you like. And... Uh, 
in of course um, Romans Paul says sin shall not have dominion over you it's in the same chapter chapter 6 where he says shall we go on sinning that grace may abound no we died to sin sin shall not have dominion over you it shall not control you you are now controlling your life by the power of God but I think uh, again he's just stressing the fact that Morality is important. That if you've really been born again, you don't go on living the same old sinful life. Gnosticism, again, was influencing some within the church. They were saying conduct isn't important. Knowledge is important so you can get into the higher realm of uh, uh, divine uh, relationship. Uh, there was no real sense of morality there. And even in that world particularly, that was true. One of the things we'll see in the second part of this DVD is how uh, prevalent was the sort of uh, sexual uh, morals uh, immorality of the day. Uh, He takes us to Pompeii and shows us something of what was going on there and can even be seen in the ruins. And I think uh, that's very much the case today, isn't it? You know, you can do what you like. Mm -hmm. There's no absolutes. What seems good to you, do it. And we're very much coming back to the same Uh, Same situation. And it affects the church. So that we don't accept what God's word is saying on certain moral things. We think we know better. We can go along with the culture of the day and the ideas of the day. Uh, But uh, the thing that we need to remember is that that God is able to keep us. Able to keep us. uh, Actually, remember he said that if we abide in him, we don't sin. The fact is that when we're not abiding, that's the trouble. Because if we were really abiding in him, we wouldn't sin. But every so often we seem to just remove ourselves, as it were, uh, from him. Do our own thing. uh, Act impulsively. Uh, But again, we're reminded here that uh, God is able to keep us. He says, um, but he who is born of God keeps him. Uh, or he, who's, uh, he who has been born of God there is Jesus Christ. He who is begotten of God. In uh, the New American Standard Version, the, the he is there uh, is in capital letters. It's reminding us that Jesus who is born of God is the one who keeps us. And keeps us from sin. And the evil one cannot touch us. So my friends, uh, we just need to remind ourselves again that we do have that power of God in our lives. Um, Remember those words in 1 Peter where it says that we are kept or protected by the power of God through faith. Kept for that salvation that is to be revealed. It is He who keeps us. We have to play our part. But essentially it is God who keeps us. But do notice it's through faith. It's a matter of continuing in faith. Because that's where our strength comes as we look to him, as we believe in him. Then we are kept by him. And then he goes on to say, uh, the the evil one cannot touch him. And I wonder exactly what he meant by that. But I think, of course, we've seen again and again that when John is writing his letters, he's remembering very much what was Uh, what he's already recorded in the Gospels, uh, that no man shall snatch him out of the Father's hand. But again, I think uh, sometimes we quote that without looking at the context. John chapter 10 and verse 27 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish And no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. But you see, verse 27 is part of that matter of no one shall snatch them out of my Father's hand, out of my hand. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. The fact is, again, that as we seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we are kept by him. 
The ability may not be there in ourselves. We can so easily be led astray. But Jesus is able to keep us. And thank God for that. And of course the Father very much is at work as well. So we're not relying on our own strength. We're not relying on our own efforts. No more than we were when we first came to be saved. It wasn't our efforts that saved us. It was His grace. It was God who saved us. And it is God who keeps us. And while there are these warnings in Scripture about if we don't abide in Him, then the branches will be cut off and thrown into the fire. I think that's a warning of the danger that lies ahead for those who don't continue. Nevertheless, all the time I look again and again to the fact that God keeps us. Because if it wasn't for that assurance... I think that sometimes we would flounder and we would just feel, Lord, I can't go on. But it is he who is there to enable us and to keep us. So John is saying a lot in this first statement. He says, we know that no one who is born of God goes on sinning habitually, if we can put it that way. The power of sin is broken. And he who is born of God, that is Jesus, who is born of God, keeps him. Jesus keeps him. And the evil one does not touch him. So thank God for that, that assurance that we can have of the help and protection of God. As we seek to walk with him day by day. Then the second statement comes in verse 19 when he says, We know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We're in one camp or the other. We either belong to God or we're in Satan's camp. It's uh, one or other. Uh, but those who have been born again are born of God. And, uh, but the whole world, we belong to God. But the whole world lies in the, in the grip of the evil one. Again, I think there's a reminder here that there was such a difference between the way in which a Christian was living and the pagan world round about them. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing our, our own nation becoming more paganized, if you like. Uh, uh, and more immoral and the differences are much more distinct I mean particularly if I look back uh, to my youth I think there was a a real uh, influence of Christianity upon society and uh, certain things people knew almost intuitively that you didn't do they were wrong but that has changed radically I'm afraid and uh, now Uh, The difference between a true believer and the world is greater. And uh, not only uh, does the the world lie in the power or the lap of the evil one, literally the world lies in the evil one. Uh, It's got here the power of the evil one. I think the authorised version has the lap of the evil one. That actual phrase isn't there. What it's saying is the world is under the control and dominated by Satan. Uh, so that all the thinking of the world is very much dominated by, by Satan. You may remember that Jesus said the world would hate us. Uh, clearly, even with a Jewish background and a certain amount of morality and so on that came from the law, uh, still he was saying that those who are not in Christ would hate us. Um, part of the reason for that is that actually by our standards we're showing up their sin. And people don't like that. And therefore they, they despise us sometimes. And we're seeing that hatred of Christians growing at the present time. Because we're still maintaining God's standards. And therefore they're saying we're bigoted. Uh, they want to write us off completely. Uh, we lose any sense of uh, rights that we might have. Uh, because the world hates our position. And I have to say that I think in terms of uh, some of the debates that go on regarding transgender and so on, if you dare oppose some of those views, you you see the the backlash, the hatred that comes. (coughs) Well, John chapter uh, 15 and verses 18 and 19 says, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world... But I chose you out of the world because of this the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they kept my word, they would keep yours also. 
And so he continues. So John is just reminding us here in the letter of something he had already brought out in the gospel, that there's a world of difference between a believer who belongs to God uh, and the one who really belongs to the enemy. And then uh, we've seen before that there is a completely different philosophy in the world. We've touched before on Colossians chapter uh, 2. See to it that no one uh, takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So clearly, and in other parts as it follows on down, saying that the world has a different philosophy to what we have got. And we're not to be caught up with that. Indeed, we're to be transformed, not to conform to this world. We're to be non-conformist. I don't need to remind you what Romans 12 verse 2 says. Incidentally, the phrase non-conformist isn't used very much these days about Christians, but they were those who didn't conform to the Anglican church uh, uh, the other free churches, as they were often known, and uh, tied in with some of the laws of the country as well. Well, we're to be nonconformist as far as the world is concerned. We are not to conform to their standards. Amen. We're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. It's saying that our minds are not right. Our minds are sinful. Our m- we're fallen beings. And all of our thoughts outside of Christ, particularly before we came to know him, uh, uh, have been led astray by the enemy. In fact, uh, again, remember Ephesians 2 says that we, we're all sons of disobedience and under the control of the prince of the air, under Satan's control. But now we're not to conform with the world. There's a difference. So going back to uh, 1 John chapter 5 again, uh, just reminding ourselves of what he said there. We know that we are of God. I want to take that phrase up, but we know that we are of God a little bit later. And that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We're of God, we're not of the world. And therefore we do not conform to the world's standards. The third thing is that he makes very plain that uh, we actually uh, have God's revelation. Verse 20. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we might know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. In his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And basically what he's saying is that we have come to know because Jesus has come. Once again, you've got that emphasis on the, on the incar- incarnation. Jesus really did take a human form. Again, for those who perhaps weren't uh, with us when we were looking at this a little earlier on. In 1 John chapter 4. And verse 1, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And of course, again and again, he stressed that Jesus is the Son of God. So he's saying that the the very Son of God... God, who is divine, took a human body. He actually came in the flesh. Forget what the Gnostics have said. And he's pointing out that Jesus has come, not only to give us eternal life, but to show us, to give us revelation. And that's very important. He says, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. We've... Again, in John's Gospel, it speaks about Jesus being the the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. He has come to bring that revelation of God. He who has seen me has seen the Father, Jesus says. So in so many ways, he had opened their understanding. And thank God, because we have the Scriptures, we have the Gospels, because we have the Holy Spirit, because Jesus came, we have that understanding, we have that revelation. God has spoken in these last days uh, by his son, as the writer to the Hebrew says. And that's the culmination of all God's revelation. There have been the law and the prophets, and that was good. God has spoken even through angels. But what he has said in his son, and what he's done in the actions of his son, 
speak louder than perhaps even words in coming to give us eternal life by his death. And uh, he goes on to say, uh, he has helped us that we know the true God, so that we might know him who is true. The word here uh, is, uh, that is used in the Greek is slightly different to what is often used for true. It really means genuine. And I think in that sense he's saying that he is the genuine God, the only real God. And perhaps he's even saying he's not a phantom, he is real. He is genuine. He took a human form. And thank God we, we know who Jesus really is. We know he's the way, the truth and the life. We know that he's the son of God. We know that he laid down his life for the sheep. Nobody took it from him. It was a sacrifice for every one of us. And as a result of that, we have eternal life. And uh, that's exactly why Jesus came, wasn't it? And we reminded ourselves the other week that eternal life is not just the length of that life, that it goes on forever, but it's a quality of life. That we have a relationship with God now. Be greater later. But we have something of a touch of heaven upon our lives now. It will be far greater later. We know his presence with us by his Holy Spirit. But we shall see him then as he is. But nevertheless, we have something of that life now. The fullness is yet to come. So thank God that uh, we know that we shall spend eternity with him as well. And uh, all of this has been revealed, has been brought about because Jesus came and gave us understanding. Thank God for that, because where would we be without him? Amen. Then he ends, and I suppose it's partly because he's talking about the true God, uh, that he says, keep yourself from idols. And uh, this almost seems to be an afterthought, but I wonder really whether it is when he's been talking about, you really do need, need uh, know the true God, Make sure you don't get contaminated in some ways by either the thoughts of the Gnostics or the world round about you. Because it will corrupt you if you're not careful. The evil one is seeking to be at work. And therefore we have to be very careful about uh, worshipping those gods and getting involved in pagan feasts. Uh, from chapters 8 to 10 in 1 Corinthians, as uh, Ashley took us through it, it was a reminder that we shouldn't uh, uh, share in those pagan feasts and eat food sacrificed to idols. You can't take the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons, as Paul is saying there. Uh, so he's very concerned that even some young Christians could be stumbled if they went into those pagan feasts. Uh, they may say the gods aren't important. We know they're not gods but he actually says they're demons. So what do you want to have a fellowship with demons with? Uh, and I think we need in these days in the whole matter of interfaith. We need to be very careful. Amen. I think we need to pray for our children. Sometimes that are taken to mosques and so on. And told about uh, these things. We need to pray that God will protect them. Yes, amen. I believe he is able in spite of even. Uh, you know I think we, we rightly don't go into mosques. Because it's a, a place where demons are worshipped. But when you think of some of the situations in which uh, the early Christians lived, where they were surrounded all the time by uh, statues of gods and all the rest of it, I think we need to be a little bit careful that we don't become too fearful. God is able to keep in the midst of it. I mean, that one letter where it says that uh, Satan has his throne in that city. What a pagan city that must have been. Nevertheless, we need to be wise in those things. And then, uh, uh, of course, the, the pagan gods, if you know anything about uh, uh, the Greek gods, they were a pretty immoral lot. So if that's the sort of god you're worshipping, it's no wonder that immorality and idolatry went hand in hand, which was particularly happening there in Thyatira, where Jezebel was encouraging them to engage in uh, idolatry, which led to immorality. You may remember part of the warning about uh, uh, Baal and um, no, um, I've forgotten his name now uh, um, took them into the, that feast of uh, Baal of Peor um, Balaam yes uh, uh, was trying to was asked to curse in the end he brought the curse upon them by, by saying well just invite them along to one of your feasts and before very long they were engaged in immorality 
So we need to uh, uh, be, obviously, or they needed to be careful when they were surrounded so much more by those things. Of course, idolatry can be something that takes the place of God. Uh, Paul reminds us that uh, we should uh, uh, beware of covetousness, which is idolatry, he says. You know, when all the time you're wanting something so much, that becomes the consuming uh, factor in your life if you're not careful. Whereas we've been reminded this morning that worship of God and living for God should be that consuming factor. And my friends, I think there are influences in our world that we need to be careful of as well, and we forget it. Uh, You know, Buddhas uh, in garden centers now, uh, trying to sell them. Even things like Lucky Charms. We shouldn't believe in any of that. Or read the stars, because it's all of that pagan world. Yoga is certainly Hinduism. And... uh, some of the great Hindus say there is no yoga without Hinduism and there's no Hinduism without yoga. And yet uh, we seem to think it's just uh, exercises. Really, it's opening up the, uh, your life to pagan gods. Mindfulness is a mixture of Buddhism uh, and Hinduism. Yeah. And yet it's becoming very prevalent again in our society, just as transcendental meditation was at the time of the Beatles. Uh, These influences are always there, and we need to be careful. I notice even the Bill Guides now, according to the paper this week, have got a badge for mindfulness rather than uh, 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 being uh, good uh, hostesses. Uh, Well, perhaps uh, the world has changed a bit, but we don't need to take on mindfulness. Uh, Meditation, nothing wrong with Bible meditation, everything right about it, of course. But that's what what is not taught. It's uh, basically uh, in... uh, using a chant to call upon pagan gods, Hindu gods. Somebody asked me the other day, do we believe in karma? Well, we certainly don't, because again, it's a mixture of Hinduism and uh, Buddhism. Uh, The idea is that past actions and thoughts, including the past life, creates good or bad results for us. Uh, So we don't accept that at all. Our life is in God's hands. All right, we have to accept, of course, there are consequences to some of the things we do. Uh, You know, if we're uh, nasty to somebody, well, uh, we might actually reap something of that uh, back. Uh, We reap what we sow, but that's not uh, karma. That's uh, true recognition that uh, we are responsible for the lives that we live. Um, Yes, certainly we don't believe in reincarnation, uh, reincarnation. After death comes uh, judgment, says scripture in Hebrews. And we need to bear those things in mind. So you see, we we need to be careful. It's not just looking back at John's time and saying, you know, yes, look at the world in which they were living. There are all those influences from the world uh, and from Satan's uh, control of things. He doesn't mind you being religious. But he does hate you becoming a believer, being born again, uh, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, we are in Christ. Um, We are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. Thank God we're in a living relationship with him. We know him as Savior and Lord. Uh, And we're hidden in the beloved, as uh, Paul says in one place. That we're secure in him. Thank God for that. Uh, This is where our security lies, in Christ alone. So just to uh, remind us uh, of what we've seen here, these three, uh, three assurances of faith, really, the things that we know, we are kept by God, basically. Uh, and then it says uh, in verse 19, we are of God. Um, some say we are from God. But basically, the Greek has literally, we are of God. And it means two things, that we belong to him and that we're born of God. Our very life comes from him, but we belong to him. Both of those things uh, are in that phrase, we are of God. And thank God that's true, if we really are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have that true revelation of God, which, thank God, leads us to eternal life. Well, I think John's, got, uh, John's letter is uh, quite a challenging one. And as we've gone through, it's not always the easiest uh, to understand, but... I trust that by God's grace as we've gone through it, 
that we have a clearer understanding, not only against the world he was writing, the situations that those Christians were facing, but you see, there's nothing new under the sun, really. All those things that were there in the past are the battles that we still face today as believers. But equally, all that blessing and strength that we have in Christ uh, is still there for us as believers. Thank God. And I trust that we can truly say, uh, I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. In fact, perhaps we might even uh, end with that uh, song in a moment or two. Uh, But let's pray. Father, we thank you that you inspired John to write these words. Lord, we know sometimes we've struggled a little bit to try to understand uh, truly what he's saying. Lord, uh, I guess by your grace we have uh, at least have a, have a greater understanding now. And Lord, we thank you again for all that you've done for us in Christ. Lord, we want to thank you for those opening words where he says that we've written these things that you might uh, have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with uh, his son uh, and with the Father. And we thank you, Lord, that you have brought us into fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, and with uh, you, our God and our Father. So we give you thanks this morning. And Lord, we pray that we might very much rest in that power of God, that we might truly be overcomers by that power of God, that we might uh, remain secure in that eternal life that even now we know. So we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.